Well, hey, good evening, and welcome to the midweek service. Listen, I'm, I'm always excited to share the word, but I'm uh, doubly excited tonight because I want to talk to you about uh, an aspect of our, uh, our health, and I want to talk about spiritual and emotional health. I want to talk about spiritual, and, and I'm using the word emotional because we are soulish creatures. We found that out last week, and we found out that uh, our, those things that comprise our personality, those things that uh, make us who we are, are housed in our soul. And so tonight, I want to talk about um, how important it is that as uh, believers, and if you are not a believer, it's certainly important for you to become a believer, but as a believer, to maintain your health uh, it, it, it's important that you understand that you are a, uh, a spirit that has a, 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 that you, and, and you are soulish and that you live in a physical body. So if you know that you are a complex, the Bible says that we are wonderfully, awesomely made. You are complex. Sometimes you, 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 it seems like that there's not one, there's no one answer to some of the dilemma and some of the challenges that you have. And listen, join the club. You're not by yourself. You, you're, you're not crazy. We are complex beings. And I want to share with you tonight how God desires for you to be, pe to, to be at peace and, and, to, and to be whole and to be healthy. So I, I, I don't want to make light of or oversimplify mental conditions or uh, emotional uh, 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 inc people who, who have uh, emotional problems or things that might even uh, so, that, so badly that they, they're incapacitated. I mean, they're, certainly um, uh, mental health is complex. It is varied. It is a varied science. But I don't believe that anything, I don't care what, and, and, and so complex because, you know, you, you can't put your hand on it. You can't put your hand on a spirit. You can't put your hand on a soul. So how do you, how do you address it? God gives us a, 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 a plan. God gives us a remedy. However, I want you to understand this, that, that, that even though you can't put your hand on the spirit, you can't put your hand on the soul, nothing is too hard for God. And that very thing that, I, I use the word peace at the, at the onset. We, that, that's, isn't, that the, isn't that the end game for, for cl clinical uh, practitioners, like, I mean, psychiatrists and, and therapists and, and um, counselors? It, isn't that the end game, that, that their patients have peace? Well, Jesus wants that same thing for you. Listen to what Jesus says. In John 14, the Bible says this. Jesus says, peace, I leave you. And then he qualifies it and he says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I was thinking about people who have mental conditions or people who, who struggle with depression uh, and and other clinical uh, psychosis and things that, you know, I'm, I'm not even smart enough to talk about, let alone uh, uh, try to delve into. So, but those people who struggle with those uh, maladies, they want peace. They're troubled. I mean, so it doesn't matter what name you put on the trouble. It doesn't matter what name you put on the anguish or what's, you know, whatever's causing it. The remedy is peace. 
Because the scripture goes on to say, let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. I mean, anxiety. People are just anxious about everything, and those things trouble. Those things bring trouble. It brings. It brings. Uh, 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 it brings about uh, a struggle with the uh, ability to go forward out of circumstances that uh, are a result of uh, some of the, maybe it may be some choices that you have made, or uh, and sometimes things happen in our lives that. Listen, my hands are, are clean of it, uh, but we live in a fallen world, so we are going to deal with broken circumstances and broken situations. But nonetheless, I, I need a way through it. I need a way out of it. And God has given us that. And, and, and so he says, don't let your heart be, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled uh, about these things. And so anxiety and then he said, let not, uh, and, and neither be afraid. Fear, anxiety, and fear are those probably the, the two main components or principles uh, that create mental and emotional anguish and that rob people. Anxiety and, 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 and fear or going around robbing people robbing people of their joy, robbing people of their faith, robbing people of their sense of assurance and their security. And, and Jesus reminds us that the peace that he brings is not like the peace that the world brings. And I, believe me, I am not marginalizing uh, clinicians, uh, psychiatrists, or I thank God for uh, our, our mental health uh, uh, practitioners. But I want you to know something. Jesus is saying is what the world offers you as peace is not always going to be the answer. What the world offers you as peace, and, not, and some of the things that the world, most of the things that the world would, would like to offer you as peace uh, does not come in the form of any, anything that, that's uh, ultimately going to be in your best interest. Some people use uh, alcohol to uh, comfort themselves. Some people use drugs to comfort themselves. Some people use relationships. I mean, even things that are, are, are a gift to us, relationships, those are, that, that's a gift to us from God. I mean, but when you use them in the place of what God has intended for you to have to maintain your health, and ultimately, that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, it, I have uh, in the past, and, and even now, you hear people use the term soul and spirit interchangeably. And I want to say that it is erroneous. They use that, those, those terms uh, interchangeably, and it's erroneous. So, but in the interest of time, I want to address the importance of, of the need for health in both aspects of our lives, both our spiritual lives and our emotional or our soulish uh, lives. So let me make the difference first between soul and spirit. And I'm going to do that two ways. The first, the Bible makes a difference. And then I'm going to demonstrate in the, lang the original language that, that those words are used that they are different. First of all, let's look at the Bible. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. See, what the word of God is telling us is that the soul can be separated from the spirit. And, and if the soul and the spirit can be separated, that's what the word divide means, right? So if the soul and the spirit can be separated, that means they are two distinct things. It says, even dividing, and I like the word even because when we use the word even, what we're trying to say is, man, you know, something is, is, is so, so powerful that it can even do this. Or something is so... Uh, 
uh, strong that it could even do this, or something is so moving that it can even, if, if we want to make a point, we could say, man, that comedy was so funny that it could even put a smile on uh, the most stoic person's face. We're trying to demonstrate how, how, how it is able to do that. So the Bible says that the Word of God is even able to separate soul and spirit. So it's almost like God is saying, I, I know it's hard to separate because they are, they, 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 they're so similar, right? Because you can't see a soul, you can't see a spirit. Sometimes they're, uh, even in the original language, uh, and we'll look at that, um, uh, air and spirit, uh, uh, breath and soul, you know, they, 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 they have the same characteristics. So it's, a, it's, it's no big deal that people uh, use them interchangeably, but I want you to understand that there is a difference. There's a difference between your spirit and your soul, and you need health in both aspects of your personhood. That's how you get to whole healthy me. You want your spirit and your soul, and next week we'll end up talking about how we need even our physical bodies. Because we remember we said that man is a triune being. Triune meaning three parts. He is soul, he is spirit, and he has a physical body. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you're in a body. All right? You, so uh, type that in uh, if you're online with me. I am a spirit, I have a soul, I'm in a body. All right? So you're a triune being. And God's word says that his word is so sharp. In other words, what does the word sharp mean? It means accurate. His word is so on point. God's word is so on point, so in line with the intent of God that he, the word of God knows the difference between the soul and the spirit and can address both soul and spirit. That, that, I, 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 I'm so thankful that I serve a God who knows his people. He's created us wonderfully, awesomely, and uh, he has a plan. He didn't just create us and say, you know, do whatever you, you want to do and figure this out. God is not just telling you, hey, uh, uh, go, go away, boy, you bother me. Uh, 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 handle it, handle it, handle it. Uh, figure this out. Man, God loves you. He's all about you. He is. The, it, you know, and I'm not trying to, uh, to, to, to what do they call it? I'm not trying to gas you up right now. I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to, to blow smoke. I want you, man, God loves you for real. He, and he has a plan, and his plan works. So now, I, I've demonstrated through Scripture that there's a difference between spirit and soul. Now, I want to demonstrate through uh, the, the original language that the Scripture speaks with in the Greek, the, the, um, uh, the New Testament. The Bible says this, the, uh, the, the Bible uses the word soul, and the Greek word is um, sisio or sisio. Psych, and it, it's, it's sisio, and our, and our word psyche comes from the word sisio. Our soul is reflected in our personality. That is the way we, we feel, the way we think. When you talk about emotions, you're talking about how somebody feels the way they think. You talk about their proclivities. I mean, that's the things that they like or the things that they dislike. Uh, you, 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 you talk about the things that they are, uh, you know, what they, uh, what they would be attracted to or, or not attracted to or repulsed by even. So the word sisio, uh, and then there's a different word for spirit, though. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, pneuma. And it, and, and, and it uh, we, you men, uh, you, you use pneumatic tools. You know how we men, you know, we, we're, just, we're just older boys is all. 
and <laughs> we like toys. Our toys just uh, are more powerful, and they get they get uh, they're more expensive, and um, and, and they make more noise uh, ultimately. But the, uh, we, and so we like power tools, and their pneumatic tools are driven by air. They're power tools that are driven by air. So the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And it's not just any kind of air. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, vapid air. It's not air without any strength. When, you, when that air comes through that hose and you plug that thing in, I mean, have you, have you ever used a, a pneumatic tool? That, that, that air is powerful. I mean, oftentimes I, when I'm inflating the air on my tire at home, I have one of those things that you plug into the, you probably have one too, you plug into your, your lighter and you wait 10 minutes and, and, your, and your tire is inflated. That's a pneumatic, I, I mean, that's, that's pneumatic, but it's, it, it, it's run by electricity. Now you get one of those, those uh, powerful tubes that they use at the garage with an air tank, Man, I mean, straight air. And you plug, you put that thing on your tire, zoop, you better hurry up and take it off or you'll be buying a new tire. That thing is powerful. So the word pneuma that God gives the Spirit is a powerful word. He wants to, he wants to uh, uh, convey, he wants to communicate a sense of power. Will you write that down in, in the chat room? God wants you to know that you are powerful. God wants you to know that you are powerful. Who you are, in essence, is powerful. It refers to the part of man that connects and communicates with God. Your spirit connects and communicates with God. You see, our spirit differs from our soul because our spirit is always, and this is the spirit of a, of a believer, is always pointed and, and get this, I want you to get this word, oriented. Our spirit is oriented, pointed, or oriented toward, and everybody, whether you are saved or not, your spirit exists exclusively for God. See, that's the problem. The devil wants your spirit. And, he, and, 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 and so he, he'll do whatever he can to get to your spirit. Why? Because your spirit is what's eternal. Your spirit is, a, is what's going to last forever. When everything else goes away, the Bible talks about this, the, even the, 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 the sky burning away with a, a, a fervent heat and, and, and this world be dissolving. When every only thing that's going to last is your spirit. And the devil knows that's eternal that every one of us is going to end up somewhere. We have an eternal resting place, whether that be in the presence of God or in the absence of God. And I'm here tonight preaching. I'm here tonight pleading. I'm here tonight begging. I'm here tonight imploring that you would understand that your spirit is eternal and that you don't have uh, the, the luxury of tomorrow. You don't have the luxury. No man knows what is going to happen tomorrow. That's why we beg you with you. We who stand on the platform plead with you. We know the value of your spirit. We know the value of your spirit. So that's why we come across as some madman or some mad woman pleading with you to, to listen to us, pleading with you to stop what you're doing, put that down, Pay attention. This is an opportunity for you to hear a message that can determine your eternal destination. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't ever want to go anywhere where it's, it's uncomfortable. And sometimes I, I am. I have to go places that's uncomfortable, but I know that I'm going to get out. I'm a, I know that it's only going to be a while, and I'll go, you know, I'll, I'll go. I, I, I don't know whether it's uncomfortable because of the environment or because of the people I have to uh, uh, interact with or whatever, but I know that it, eventually I get to go. But it's not like that in eternity. In eternity, wherever you go, that's where you are forever, forever. So, yeah, if you want to call me a madman, 
Look, look, mom, look, dad. Here, here's that crazy little black fella on the screen spitting and slobbering all over himself and screaming. It is because I love you. It is because I know the value of your spirit. It is because I know that eternity is not even time. We, we, we say eternity is a long time. No, it's past a long time. Eternity is eternity. So one way to illustrate this, this there's this dichotomy that will show you that there's a difference between your soul and your spirit. There are many instances where, where my personality, where my emotions, my proclivities, would have me do one thing while my spirit would have me do something else. Anybody ever experienced that? Where, where, where man, you think on the inside of you, you want to do such and such, but in, in, in response to some, something that has been provoked you, but there's a deeper inside of you. There, you know, I, I got the inside of me, but then there's a deeper inside of me. I, I like what the Bible, how the Bible refers, refers to the spirit man. The Bible refers to the spirit man as a man of valor. You know, th that man that, ha that has these values and and, and even when even people who have not said yes to Jesus and who have not had their spirit oriented toward God. Now, all of our spirits are created exclusively for God. And, but even people who have not, uh, of their own volition, free will, because God has given us that, right? But even people who have not uh, given God their, uh, 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 of their own free will, or oriented or, or themselves, their spirits, or said yes to God, even they have sometimes this dichotomy inside of them. There's, a, there's, there's their personality, but then they have this eternal spirit that knows something. You ever just, I, they, I can't, I don't have words to say. I can't put it in words. I, I might sound like I'm befuddled or uh, or, or my tongue is tied, or I mean, I, I just can't find the words. Say, but I know that there is something more. I know that there is something greater. I know that there's a deeper call in my life. You know, the, the Bible talks about deep call into deep. Your first God connects. Remember, we said our spirits are connected and oriented toward God. It's our soul that gives us the problem that causes the struggle the internal struggle. Listen to Paul's description of this to the church in Galatia. He says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are, con they are in conflict with each other so that uh, you are not to do whatever you want. Now, understand the word flesh here refers to our carnal nature. What, write that down in the chat room, will you? My flesh is, is related to my carnal nature. My flesh is related to my carnal nature. So the word flesh refers to our carnal nature, or for uh, more contemporary, our fleshly thinking. And our thinking and individuality are housed in our soul. So here, he's still he's talking about the soul. Your spirit wants to do something. Your soul wants to do something else. There's this conflict. This is why we must constantly renew it from the way the world thinks and our old way of thinking. It can be reinfected with that disease that I call, and many others, stinking thinking. If you don't constantly renew your mind, if you don't constantly renew your, 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 your thinking, your soul, your spirit, your, I mean, not your spirit, your soul, your thinking, your, your, um, your emotions, if you don't, if you don't um, immerse those things in the Word of God, 
you can be reinfected with thinking. Anybody ever been reinfected with thinking, stinking thinking? I, I've been reinfected with stinking thinking because of my uh, lack of devotion to prayer or devotion to spending time in the, in the Word of God. Now, this is a dilemma that, that every believer is faced with, but it is not something that we can use as a plausible excuse to live a defeated life. This is not a plausible excuse for you to live a defeated life. People say, oh man, I, I really want to do right, or I, I, I really want to uh, obey what God is saying, but it, it is, you know, I, in one side, one part of me wants to do this, and one part of me wants to do that. Well, that is not a plausible excuse for you to live a defeated life because a battle exists. Because a fight ensues. Yes, when, 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 when there is, the Bible says uh, uh, evil is always present. The, the book of Romans, Paul says to the Roman church, he says, Evil is always present. So the bat, there's always going to, to be a fight. The battle is always going to be ensuing. Evil is always present. So you can't use that as a plausible excuse to, to just give up, to throw in the towel, to wave the, the, the white flag of surrender. Do not surrender to darkness. Do not surrender to evil. Do not surrender to negativity. Do not surrender to doubt. Do not surrender to lust. Do not surrender to those things that are ultimately meant to defeat you and undermine your relationship, your orientation toward God. God loves you. He wants you. He's, he's seeking after you. He has me here pleading for you. God loves you. God loves you. This is Paul's way of being persuasive. He says, well, well, well let me, even before I read the scripture, let me, let, me, let me say this. So, let me illustrate what I mean by you don't have a plausible excuse. I'm going to do that by telling you the story of two wolves. There were two wolves that were born at the same time to the same mother in the same place. As time went on, one wolf grew strong, big, healthy, while the other remained a runt. Why do you think that is? Because one wolf got all the food. Whatever you feed is what will grow. So it is no excuse because there is a fight. I'm telling you that there's going to be a fight. There's going to be a fight. So that's not an excuse. Let's drill deeper. Let's drill past the fight and get equipped. First acknowledge that, yes, there is this dichotomy. There exists between my, my carnal flesh and, 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 my, and my spirit. They want, one wants me to do this, the other wants me to do that. And evil is always there. It's going to always be there. So I'm going to always have to make a conscious decision to do what is right. I'm going to always have to make a conscious decision to live holy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't get easier. Some people think, even like, for example, and I want to be transparent, uh, uh, and, I, and, I want to, uh, and I want to be clear, uh, we're, we're coming out of uh, COVID, and, and so a lot of people are, are starting to get married and, and stuff. And I want people, like, I, I've, I've counseled young men, and, and they think, listen, getting married is not going to stop the devil from coming after you and tempting you with lust. That's not the answer. The answer is 
that you make a decision every day that you're going to be faithful to God and your wife? That's the answer. Evil is going to always be present. And, and, and it's so sad. There are many people who think that they're going to, that that's going to help them. That ain't going to help you. You're going to have to engage the battle. And you can win. I'm a witness. You can win. There are many other examples, but I just knew that that one was a clear one. And, and I, I, I thought that'd go cut right to the chase. Uh, if, I, if I'm correct and that, and that did it for you, that made you understand it, just say, and, and write it down in the chat room, I, I, I understand, Pastor. So Romans 12 and 1 says this. Paul is insistent. He's imploring. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The, old, the King James Version says, this is your reasonable service. That this, it's reasonable for, for God to have those expectations of us in light of the mercy that he's extended to us. He's saying, listen, just I, I want you to take a stand in your life for righteousness. You are a broken human being. You're probably not going to, no probably, you're not going to win every battle, but you're going to win the war because the war is not contingent on you win in the battle. The victory of uh, uh, the overarching victory has already been won, has already been secured. The overarching victory has already been secured at Calvary when Jesus died. He made it possible for you to be able to escape the, the, the torture, to escape the, the, uh, the, the deception, to escape uh, uh, the, being held hostage by the enemy. He did that when he died. The Bible says that he put the devil to open shame. He, he, he got victory over him. You don't have, you don't have to, to worry about your brokenness being the end all. Why? Because the war has already been won. Amen. I believe that today. If you believe that, say amen. In that chat room, write it down. Amen, amen. Of our own free will, we have to present ourselves to God. He says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And this is the operative part of the scripture. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember what we said, you can't, your, 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 your spirit is going to be, uh, I mean, your, your soul is going to be weak and insipid and without uh, the ability to fight if you don't immerse it in uh, a, a regular rhythm of worship. If you don't have devotion time, if you don't have prayer time, if you don't spend time in the presence of God, you're, you're, you're going to be that, your soul is going to be that wolf that is a runt that never grows. You don't want that to be. You don't want your flesh to be all, you know, I can't wait. I'm, I, many of you know uh, that attend our church that I was in an accident in February and, and I haven't been able to go to the gym since and I I feel like that Pillsbury Doughboy. I feel pudgy, and, and if you poke me, I'll go, ooh. Uh, I, I, I feel that way. Uh, uh, but I can't wait to get back in the gym and, and, and tone up and, and firm up I, 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 because I've not been doing anything physically uh, to uh, not even eating right to uh, make sure that my body is healthy. I can't do that, but ultimately I'll be able to get back in there and do some things. But as a result of that, my, my physical body is not as strong as I would like for it to be and as strong as it has been in the past. So I'm saying to you that if you want your soul to be strong, you know, people who, who, are, who have assurance 
in their relationship with God, who people who have a, and I'm going to beat this horse to death, guys, people who have a regular rhythm of worship, write that down in the chat room, regular rhythm of worship, regular rhythm of worship. People who have a regular rhythm of worship, get in, get in, get in sync with God, get in sync with the Holy Spirit, get in sync with the, with, with, just like you do, you, 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 you shop for groceries at a certain uh, time in the week. You, you go get gas. You, gotta, you have a rhythm that you, 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 know, you get up and you, you, you have a rhythm as you prepare for work and all that. Get in rhythm with the Holy Spirit. Get something going. Get in a dance with God. He wants to, listen, in the, the Bible says he's going to throw a big party, a big wedding shindig in the end, and he wants you to save the last dance for him. And how do you do that? Get in rhythm with him now. Get in rhythm with the Holy Spirit. Oh my. I encourage you today to get a regular rhythm of worship. Will you write this down? Pleasing God requires you to surrender your will. And that will never happen until you change your mind. You'll never surrender your will until you change your mind. And that's what being immersed in the Word of God will bring you. It will bring you a changed mind. We could, we could change people's addresses so that they don't go places we don't want them to go. We could change the way they're dressing. You know, oftentimes, I, I mean, when I, I came up in the church when, 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 at a time when I was young where they, they put a lot of emphasis on how you dressed and, and things like that. And, and if a, a lady was, was, was too revealing or, 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 uh, or and, and it, to me it was one-sided and unfair. They put more attention on the, what the women wear than, than the men, you know, and uh, you know, they, they equated that with holiness. And let me tell you something. Um, you, 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 people uh, that were dressing in, in, in whatever the, the, the established and acceptable ways that they, that they established in were still doing wrong. And they, were, they just looked good doing it. <laughs> they, they were wrong, they just looked good doing it. They, just looked, they looked like church folk, but they were still doing wrong. They were church folk doing, they were, they were church folk doing wrong, you know. But God wants you to be a, to have integrity in your walk with him so that there is this, there is this, uh, there is this synchronization of your spirit and your soul so that as your spirit is oriented toward God, that your soul brings you into um, practices and a thought life that is conducive to you um, flourishing spiritually. So to truly be healthy, we must start at ground zero. I, our, our spirits, our spirits are ground zero. And that's why no matter, every, everything I talk about tonight, whatever I talk about tonight, if you have not been born again, the first step towards having victory in your life, the first step to you realizing your purpose and being fruitful and flourishing, the first step to you being that best version of yourself, that God had intend, has, has intended you to be and created you to be. Remember, your, our spirits were created exclusively for God. To truly be healthy, we must start at ground zero. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Ground zero, ground zero, get in Jesus. How do you do that? How do you get in, if any man be in Christ? In other words, if any man or woman, and, and listen, I took some liberty today, when I, even the title of my, of my message, I, I talked about as a man thinks and his spirit leans, 
you know, it's not just about men. It's, it's about women, too. And that just shows you I'm, I'm old-fashioned, and, and we use the word man universally. Uh, and I was trying to be cute. I was trying to play on the Proverb 23, as a man think is kind of thing. But I want, this is not just about men. This is about people. And the Bible says that you, the old has gone, the new is here. If anyone... King James says, if any man, but the, 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 the NIV says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. So you, that's ground zero. John 3 says, this is Jesus' answer to a man by the name of Nicodemus who wanted to know literally what, what, what spiritual ground zero was. He wanted to know what spiritual ground zero is. And Jesus talked to him. In his response, he said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless the, they are born of water and the Spirit. Your spirit must be born of the Spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. What, why, did, why would he tell Nicodemus? He says, you, 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 you should not be surprised. In other words, man, we live in a fallen world where the devil has wreak havoc. He's got people addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, addicted to themselves, addicted to sex, addicted to you name it. I think that's one of the most horrendous, one of the, 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 the worst curses that came crept up out of the abyss of hell onto mankind is the spirit of addiction. And he's saying, so you shouldn't be surprised that I tell you you got to be born again. Man, we, you, you, God is so holy. And without us being born again, we are carnal and, and, and earthly and ugly and dark in our spirits. So Jesus says, don't be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. Will you write this down and we're done? We become new creations. And here's that word again. And our orientation is completely changed. Our orientation is completely changed when we become new creations. That way now, and some people are surprised. They says, man, when I, when I said yes to Jesus, Man, things, I, I started having to re really fight about, I had this fight going on inside of me. That's when things started really uh, being troublesome. Well, yeah, because your orientation changed. Now your spirit is oriented toward God and is calling on your soul to get right. We used to sing a song that said, get right, church, and let's go home. I'm going to ask if you would just bow your heads right where you are. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. God loves you so much, and he's calling you to himself. My pleading is his pleading. My imploring you, my strong urgings are because of who is in me. I pray tonight that what I said to you is clear, clear enough for you to make a decision today. If you've never said yes to Jesus, right where you are, you don't have to have me in your presence or any other pastor or you don't need, you don't even need a, a, a witness, but you need to uh, tell people afterwards. But right where you are, you could be by yourself. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. 
I'm going to pray with you. You don't have to say it out loud. You're not talking to me or anybody around you. The only thing that's necessary is that you be sincere. And I don't believe you would want to even say the prayer if you weren't sincere. Just say this with me. Father, Father God, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. I thank you for loving me enough to call me out of the darkness to light. For, for, for even saying what darkness is and what light is. I don't know a whole lot about the Bible or even you, but I want to learn about you. I want to learn more. I want to be more distinctively your child. And tonight, I willingly give you my heart. So right now, I believe that Jesus is coming into my life, coming into my heart. And he's forgiven me of my sins because I've asked him to do that. He said he would. And I am saved. My spirit is now oriented. I know that I was created exclusively for God, but now I am oriented toward my creator. And he is going to strengthen me to fight the good fight. I thank you for it in Jesus' name, and amen.